It's good. Okay, let's go to. Oh, so it's already started. Someone started it. Okay. Oh, okay, great. All right. Welcome to a conference room at CNN. Amazing. <laughs> I was gonna have like this in the background over here, which are like all the. Can you see them? Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. My hero. Thank you. Um, but I'm not gonna do that. Perfect. So let's just make sure we don't have this open in other windows. Okay, uh, I don't. I don't think. Okay. Oh. Because oh. I, I can hear myself a bit. It might oh. be me. Do you have it open? I had it at first, and it was. Uh, I, I had it open another window at first, and it was doing that. Let me. Uh, let me exit and come right back at. Okay. All right. Well, now I'm just here. Okay. Hi, guys. I think this will probably go smoother in a second. It's just me and you guys in a conference room at CNN. But good questions already. I'm excited to answer these. All right. All right. Better? Yay. Okay. Um, so you want to give us a, a quick tour of, uh, of, you know, where you are right now? Um, God, I wish I was in the newsroom. I, I'm two floors up from the newsroom um, because I didn't want, like, actual live television or a background shot. Um, although that would have been cool now that I think about it. Um, but I am in a conference room at CNN, our headquarters in New York. Um, this particular conference room, I think we have a lot of like editorial discussions. Um, and you know, you're somebody at CNN if your face is on the wall. So like, your okay, first, I mean, and maybe not in this room, but there's always room to grow. See, there you yeah, go. Yeah. You can see right over here. Um, <laughs> there's always room to get on the wall. I think you have to be an anchor for that. Um, but, uh, we are at CNN and I was just, I've been on this morning talking about uh, Mark Zuckerberg having a child. Um, yes, so I, if, we, if, if this were two hours later, I would have had to leave in the middle of it and go be on live television and come back or like find some way to incorporate it. Um, but we're our, it's, it's been, a, it's been a, a pretty good busy day, but I'm glad to join you guys. This is cool. Yeah, uh, so uh, everybody welcome to Product Hunt Live. We are uh, super uh, lucky to have uh, Lori Siegel from CNN Money uh, join us. Um, so let's let's start there. Actually, what did you kind of make of the the Zuckerberg letter and the you know the pledge to give ninety nine percent and and all of the reaction uh, that followed? Oh, it was. I, look, I, I think um, at least from knowing a lot of folks in Silicon Valley, I, I think it it's interesting to see him uh, come out with such a grand statement and a grand gesture. And of course, do it on Facebook. It's like so Mark Zuckerberg, right? Uh, but I think mm -hmm. we need more young people. Uh, who come into a lot of money like that, especially out in Silicon Valley, making uh, a statement like this, saying that they are going to, you know, find and finding ways to responsibly put their money. I, I thought it was it was really interesting. Uh, did you watch the video of him and Priscilla like talking to no, you today? No, I haven't seen it yet. They put out this like, this. Um, you sometimes forget that Mark Zuckerberg is like very young, um, and yeah. they put out this video of him and Priscilla, and he was like, "I just want the baby to come," and I'm like, "Oh my God, you seem so human." You sometimes forget right. that. Some of the leaders of these companies who we speak about and the press write about and we put on television um, that at the end of the day, they're human. And you see this like there was this nice little moment where he was just like a dad excited for his baby to get there, which I thought was kind of special. Yeah. And the whole paternity leave idea concept yeah. is, is fantastic, too. Yeah. Um, so before getting into a bunch of these questions and other other topics I want to cover, I know you have a uh, series on the intersection of tech and humanity coming coming out, right? Can you talk a little bit about yeah. that? Um, I, so I've been uh, covering tech for years, and, and people are always asking, like, what are you interested in? What's next? And I actually think um, what I'm most interested in is kind of now that tech is like, ubiquitous, right? Now that mm -hmm. it's such a part of life, um, this intersection of tech and humanity. So I, I've taken on a lot of different topics uh, on this. We did a piece on, like, we did a whole series on revenge porn not long ago and talking about the implications of harassment and cyber harassment. Uh, the next one we're doing is coming out next week, and it's all about uh, the idea of a hacker. I think uh, so many times we simplify what a hacker is, is a hacker, a bad hacker, and it, it's taking this idea um, of a hacker and, and kind of covering it in a nuanced way. We have what's called uh, the secret lives of superhero hackers. Um, mm -hmm. And we interview some of the good guys and some of the bad guys. I've had conversations with folks from Anonymous uh, who some might think are good, others might think are bad. For this series, we also 
uh, speak to a guy. I don't know if any of you guys ever watched Mr. Robot, but I'm kind of obsessed with Mr. Robot. Um, yeah, I heard all that. It's so great. And I spoke to a guy who um, is very much like the character in Mr. Robot on the phone. He wouldn't put his face on there uh on camera but he talks about how he hacks into for to he hacked into like a nazi uh forum promoting white supremacy and he took it down but on the other end he sells uh vulnerabilities that help people hack your credit card so it's just like it's this fascinating fascinating look at um people who kind of live in this gray area and do things that are uh legal or illegal and um we actually created a graphic novel and a comic book online to go along with it. So it's a little bit weird nice. and a little bit different. Um, but I, I think, you know, if you can take on topics like that, even for me as a journalist, like if you can take on a topic and really look at it um, through a different type of lens and really give it some room to breathe, then things can get really interesting. Yeah. And it's interesting because you're kind of in this spot where you, you know, you're kind of a translator between what's, you know, happening deep in Silicon Valley and explaining it to the rest of the world. And not, not that many people sit in, in, in that central role. What do you think is the biggest misconception uh, people, have, uh, people have about Silicon Valley? Valley, Silicon Valley, Valley. Um, you know, it's interesting to watch Silicon Valley be glamorized in the way it has been. Because when I started covering it in 2009, I would say, um, at the latest, uh, the latest like kind of tech boom, it was a lot of underdogs, right? It was a lot of really creative weirdos um, and people that um, that just didn't play by the rules. And it wasn't cool to do this. And it was scary. And we were coming out of the recession. Um, and it was just like a, a group of really, really interesting people. And, and I think people now look at Silicon Valley sometimes. Um, and you, it's so funny to go every time I go to the airport and I travel a lot for work, I see like someone I know on the cover of like Fast Company or Vanity Fair, another entrepreneur, another thing. I think people forget how hard it is to be an entrepreneur. I think that even maybe we do this sometimes in the media, but we don't talk about um, how difficult it is and how mo many, many, many people fail. And I think we don't talk about enough how, um, you know, how failure is such an incredible, incredibly important part of success and that no entrepreneur that's had massive, massive success hasn't also had massive failure. I think people very much uh, glamorize Silicon Valley now. There's shows about it. Hollywood's interested in it. Um, and I, I don't think we, we I, I don't think people understand that it can be dark and it can be hard and being an entrepreneur, you're all, it's, it's like you're 30 days out of running out of, from running out of money and like, but every time your friend asks you how you're doing, it's like killing it. We're doing great. I, I think people, um, really look at the Silicon Valley hero and, and forget that it's much more nuanced than that. It's much more gray than that. I think that's something that people don't a hundred percent understand. And for me, just knowing a lot of founders, uh, throughout the years, I, I remember a founder and I won't say his name, but I remember seeing him at a tech conference and like, he doesn't go to as many anymore because he's a, a bigger founder and he doesn't really have to kind of go promote his stuff. But I've known him for years, and I remember why the, the company was going through a lot. And I remember him sitting at a table. And, and as a journalist, we always kind of, or I like to think, we look at you in a way that, like, sometimes you forget, like, that we're looking at you, you know? And I could just see how tired he was, and I could see how stressed he was. And, um, and, I, was, and I was just like, and everyone kept walking up to him and being like, man, you're doing so well. You're killing it. And he almost looked like he wanted to cry. And, and no, I don't think many people saw that. And I, and I walked up to him, and I was like, I was like, it must get like a little exhausting. And he's like, to be honest, Lori, and I've known him for years. So he's told me this. He's like, I, he's like, I walked into my office the other day and just started crying. You know, like, I don't think people, um, people really talk about that kind of stuff because how can you, right? It's, it's, it's difficult, but I think that stuff is, uh, is kind of important. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, and how about you in, in your path? Uh, did you know you wanted to you know, be writing about tech in 2009 and be where you are right now? Also, you know, how, how did you? Um, not at all, actually. I, I always think of like my life has been and my career has been kind of like on my way to something else, right? Um, which I think a lot of great companies are built on their way to something else. Um, I started out at CNN right out of college in 2008, and I was my dream was to be a breaking news producer. I wanted to produce and I wanted to chase the news and I wanted to be in the field and, and I still love being in the field, but, um, but you know, it, it was, 
it, it was very much the last thing on my mind, to be honest with you, was covering technology. I, I have a joke. Like I sometimes, I, I, I had like def technical difficulties getting on here. I sometimes like look at technology and it breaks. Like I just like, you know, I think I was never like this like nerdy, nerdy, like I love tech, I love whatever. But what I really fell in love with, I think, was um, I got a job working at, um, like I, I was freelance at the time and I got a job at a, as a production assistant uh, covering Wall Street. And I was so bored, man. I was just like, and I was done every day at, uh, at 4 p.m. And I was just like, this is so boring. And, and, I, um, and I remember just falling into this group or finding this group of weirdos in New York. It was right when people were talking about Silicon Alley um, that I really liked. And it was just people that I thought were creative um, and interesting and, um, and, and that was what I fell in love with. I think I fell in love with this idea of the underdog. I fell in love with this idea that uh, maybe you didn't have to go to Wall Street to be a success, or maybe you didn't have to be uh, a, a, an attorney like your mom wanted you to be. You could go create a, a company. And I loved people that were obsessed with problems that I didn't even know we had. Um, and, and I think that's what I fell in love with. It, I've always kind of liked the idea of humanity uh, and technology. I think I've always really fall in love with um, ideas and people and persistence and resilience. Um, those are the stories that I think are really interesting. Not And the technology is kind of the perk behind it, the tech that ends up changing the world. So my career path was a little bit weird in that I always wanted to be a breaking news reporter. And then I fell into this group and I really wanted to, I remember trying to convince like CNN that, um, that we should put, uh, that we should put the Instagram guys on TV. I was like, I think these guys are going to be big. And now we have like teams devoted to, you know, to Instagram and all this stuff. Um, and so, uh, you know, I very much in my free time when I was covering Wall Street, I would go to these things and I would meet a lot of these founders and I would always kind of um, pretend to be much more important than I was. And I would, I remember paying my way to South by Southwest in like 2009 or 2010 and just being saying to CNN, oh, I'm here. And I happened to have all these interviews with the founders of Twitter and Foursquare and um, we should put them on camera. And, and I convinced them to send my best friend who is a photojournalist. And we just interviewed everyone we possibly could um, and and brought it back. It was almost like we didn't wait for anyone to tell us we could go do this or, or you know, we wanted, I was almost a little bit entrepreneurial about it. Um, and those people ended up creating these products that, you know, ended up kind of going viral and, and changing the world. So, um, you know, this is that's a kind of a long answer to, to the fact that I never thought this would be my career path, but it was what I was attracted to. Uh, and it's kind of what I found on my way to wanting to be a breaking news producer. Now I'm our tech correspondent for the network and I get to, you know, they send me with a whole crew to South by Southwest. We have a satellite truck, you know, now things are, are really different. But um, it was always, I think for me, you know, kind of celebrating the underdog and, and, you know, telling these stories was always very important to me. Uh, it's very different now. The, a lot of these guys aren't, aren't necessarily, and girls aren't necessarily like the underdog anymore, but it's, it's been really interesting. Uh, you're still also you know, pretty young. Do you think about, and you think about the arc of your career, do you parlay this into, into something else? Do you like double down and say, I'm going to be the best tech reporter and correspondent? There, there is. How do you think about in the net, when you think about? Like, um, hmm. I, I think you know what excited me years ago doesn't excite me as much now. Um, new things excite me, though. I think you have to be. Um, I, I think it's it's kind of hard to look at uh, the future, and I think about this a lot, right? A lot of the people when I started covering tech, a lot of those people have moved on to do different things or do their own startups. And oftentimes you cover all these people who are putting their money where their mouth is and who are changing the world in many different ways. Um, but for me, you know, I am a journalist. My whole life I wanted to be a journalist. I've always uh, looked at people and wondered what was up and wondered about their stories. I remember uh, in high school, I was the editor of my school newspaper and I was, um, I was obsessed with like the really elderly track coach who everyone used to make fun of because how could it be a track coach if he was 90 years old and like could never run or whatever and I just loved I thought he was so fascinating and I remember um interviewing him for the school newspaper and finding out that he had had Parkinson's and that he had been in the war I, he just had so many incredible stories and, and I remember thinking then like I'm going to be a journalist the rest of my life um so it's funny as obsessed uh, as with a certain problem as some entrepreneurs are, that's how obsessed I am with a great story um, and finding an incredible story. 
Um, but you know, my ultimate goal, do I want to be the best tech reporter in the world? I, I mean, no, do we have, look, we have like incredible people that do incredible things. I don't want to be, um, I'm not probably going to write in the same way someone from Recode would write something. I think the stories, and as I grow in my career that I'm more and more attracted to, are these larger stories, are the stories that we're not talking about uh, yet. I feel like I have to go find them, you know, all over again. And I, and I think we did a, an interesting series called Sex, Drugs, Silicon Valley, um, where it was yeah, really, it was just like a weird, weird series. But I think I might be one of those people that just everyone kind of tells me they're weird things. And so like getting to know a lot of these entrepreneurs, I think everyone kind of off the record would tell me like, oh, my friend's becoming polyamorous or trying this or that. And I was like, there might be something here. Let's do a, let's do a series on it. Let's dig into it. Tell us how that unfolded. Did you, like, were, were there pushback from, <laughs> from CNN? Like, how did? Um, you know, it's interesting. I remember being on air and I had a piece on like these like engineers who were going to swinging parties. And I was just like, how did this happen? I cannot believe I put this on television, but it was, um, it was, For those yeah. who the piece, can you, just um, you know, so I think, so the first big kind of series we did, and it got turned into a 30 minute show for the network. Um, it, it was like a multi-platform, uh, you know, multi-part series and it was called sex drugs, Silicon Valley. And the reason I came up with the idea for it, um, was just a lot of the investors I know, a lot of the entrepreneurs I know who I've known for years, you know, and off the record conversations would joke about um, people trying out different lifestyles, the stuff that's not like based on Silicon Valley, but there was a lot of money, a lot of freedom, a lot of whatever. And people started talking to me about how their friends are trying out polyamory or they're trying out like all these different um, which if you don't know what polyamory is, that's um, having like multiple relationships. I don't know. We don't have to turn this into the relationship time, but um it was uh, it was really interesting I, just to hear about it and how people are trying out you know smart drugs like you have like Tim Ferriss who's like this idea of like biohacking um, and trying to like you know any rules we play by in normal society where you think you need to you know drugs are bad you know dating more than one person is bad like it's almost this kind of like this mentality that was happening uh, of people trying out all different sorts of things so. I did a lot of reporting on it and we got people to come on camera with us and talk about it. Like the guy that coined the hashtag on Twitter, um, Chris, Chris was Chris very much, Chris, we, I spent a lot of time talking to him and he opened up about uh, like polyamory and like trying to, I had this idea of disrupting relationships, which for me, like it was so weird. Um, but it's also like, who am I to judge? Right. I love those stories. I love stories where I get like a teeny bit uncomfortable um, and where I'm kind of like, wait, what? Um, and we did something on like the swinging scene in Silicon Valley, which I did say required me um, going to a uh, going to a swingers party. <laughs> like, you know, it was very strange and it was weird, but uh, it did really well. And, and people were interested in it, as you as you can imagine. But I guess to, to kind of round it out, it's it started a conversation. Um, and, and for me, it was just interesting. Like I, I got to do reporting of not just like this is a hot new company, uh, but kind of talk about this intersection of tech and humanity. It's the same deal with um, the revenge porn series we did. I, I got on the phone with a hacker who used to hack into women's inboxes, steal their photos and post them online for money. Um, and I and I got on the phone with him. Uh, and obviously, it wasn't easy to get on the phone with him, but had almost like this like confessional where he talked to me about why he did what he did. Um, and it was just so strange and weird. Uh, but I, I like those stories. I think those stories are interesting. So um, but when you to go back to like the future of uh, career stuff, I think you have to continue evolving. I, I don't think I could probably just be a startup reporter anymore because I, I've been doing that for years. I think that's why I, I kind of move forward and cover some different topics or kind of take things with like a larger, uh, a larger lens. Um, so I don't actually know, you know, what the, the future will be, but I, I think for me, I think it's really interesting to take on these larger topics in a nuanced way and, and speak honestly about them uh, and put them out there on a grand on a grand scale, like on CNN, on digital and on television. That's what are other broader trends, uh, you know, at the intersection of tech and, and kind of, you know, human stories that you think are underreported that you're excited to you know, learn more about? Um, I, you know, I think we're also addicted to our devices now. I, I think it's, I became really obsessed with this idea of empathy recently and how maybe are we losing our sense of empathy or, are we, or how can technology help us with empathy? Like you have this idea that uh, like virtual reality can uh, put us in situations. I, I actually tried out Charity Water, which is uh, a, an organization where people kind of donate uh, for clean water. They have 
this new VR experience, right? Where you can put on, uh, you can put on a headset and you can watch as a well is being built uh, somewhere uh, across the world that's bringing clean water to people. And that helps you with empathy. I think that's really, really interesting when you talk about like this intersection of tech and humanity. I think it's interesting that even in Silicon Valley, there's like a school where you can't have, where a lot of tech people are sending their kids where you don't have connected devices. Um, I, I, all that stuff to me is really fascinating because I think we're at this weird point where, you know, tech is, is just so enormous it's taking away it's it'll be interesting to see and to kind of ask some larger questions uh, about that i think those are trends that i'm i'm particularly interested in also you know i it's funny i, I think the hacker series we have is important coming out too because i think it's time we stop simplifying this idea of hacking it's time companies take hackers good ones bad ones seriously um you know the i covered extensively the ashley madison hack um which was which was pretty interesting because you know you had these hacktivists who posted all this personal data about people who were using this website to potentially cheat on their significant others it started this larger conversation i think about society which was really interesting but it also showed the power of hackers um and the power that you know they can have and, and it was just so so interesting so i think all of uh, you know when you look at um, this intersection of tech and humanity, I think kind of uh, everything's coming together in a, a pretty interesting way. Um, so yeah, that's a long convoluted answer to that. Yeah, no, no, no. Let's, let's talk about like, the craft uh, of, of, of what you do for a second. So I, I grew up watching Charlie Rose mm -hmm. interviews and I'm still a big fan. But it, was, it was interesting that I would learn so much, but I would never learn kind of Charlie's own personal yeah. opinion. He kind of, you know, as a true journalist. Is that something that, how do you think about you know, kind of your own opinions in the context of the stories that you're you're presenting around. You know, pretty you know, somewhat controversial. Um, topics. it's a good question. I think, um, like I'm a very opinionated person, but when I put on my journalism uh, hat, uh, especially like even think about when we're doing something for me, which is kind of strange, is like I'm interviewing people like polyamorous or whatever, swingers, all this stuff. I honestly try to be as curious and non-judgmental as possible, I, and I think. Um, and I think that I, I love being proven wrong. I love asking questions that prove what I, I had to, I, what I kind of initially thought. I think it, it would, it wouldn't be honest to say that you sometimes go into something not having an opinion. You can always go into something having an opinion, but I, I think you have to be completely fair and non-judgmental, uh, and be, and also be proven wrong. I, I think that's such an important part uh, of journal of journalism. I mean, the way things are going now with the web, everyone seems to have op opinions on this or that. You almost need somebody who can go in and really, um, you know, ask non-judgmental questions, ask the hard questions. I, I think Charlie Rose. Uh, is very special and and how he does it, but he also uh, has this ability um, to get the most out of people and to get them excited and not feel like he's confronting people. I, I think there's a certain art right. uh, to asking hard questions and to getting people to be the most themselves on camera. Um, I I struggled with this when I first started going on camera. When someone puts a camera on you you automatically change a little bit, right? Um, if you're in the bright lights, if you're on television at CNN, you automatically, it does something, right? And the best and the best thing you can do is learn to be the most yourself. And I think that's what you can do when you're interviewing people. I always love when I'm interviewing people to make them feel like themselves, to make them talk about things that are exciting to them. You can also, you know, talk about kind of the harder questions. Um, but there's a certain art to interviewing. And I think, I think uh, Charlie Rose, um, does it best because he brings out the best in people. And I think you have to be non-judgmental and you have to be curious in order to do that. And when, when you, again, on craft, when you think of a topic that you want to cover, you know, you wrote this piece on polyamory, but let's just say you, you think of something like homelessness or other kind of issues that Silicon Valley is, is facing. What, uh, how do you even start? Do you look for kind of a personality? Do you look for a situation? Um, how do you get the idea? I, it all depends, right? Sometimes I'll be having like, uh, you know, I'll be having a conversation with someone and they'll mention something like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And I'll ask them to introduce me to people who know a lot about it. Like I'm particularly fo interested in uh, artificial intelligence right now. I think the next series uh, I want to do is going to be focusing on on AI and a lot of the human impact and, and some of the weirder stuff. And, and I'm just starting to do the research for it, right? So I remember being on a shoot with an entrepreneur not long ago who used to work at Apple, who was talking about AI, who knew somebody, who knew somebody 
So as soon as I really start digging into this, I'll probably go to him and ask him to introduce me to the five people he knows, right? I'll do, you know, look at the, the articles, look at who's quoted in it. Uh, I always, it's almost like you you begin to, to get put in touch with an inside baseball community the more you do. Um, it totally depends on the story. I mean, you know, when I was doing a story on revenge porn, right? And I interviewed uh, this woman who was, uh, she had had her naked photos put out everywhere and it was just this horrific situation. But it's not like she was online advertising that this had happened. We found her through an attorney who was trying to help revenge porn victims. So, um, and, and even then it was very much for me, um, I wanted to talk to the hacker who had hacked into her inbox and done this. Um, and so I just, I honestly just found his number based on what I knew about him. Um, everyone's information's online these days. Sorry guys. Uh, even mine. Um, and I found his information and I just kept calling him until he answered. I mean, like I was just persistent. I called him every day. I, same with the, uh, with the CEO of Ashley Madison, just called till the answer. I think people underestimate the power of picking up the phone and calling someone. I remember back in the day, uh, I was doing something on Sean Parker and I was trying to get in touch with him. And this is before I had a lot of connections to him. Uh, I think I actually called his father and his father was lovely, you know, but you also have to be very careful. You don't want to like, you know, you don't want to cross that line. But if you're a journalist, it's kind of your, your job to figure out the best ways to get in touch with people. Um, we did a story on high tech prostitutes trying to appeal to new money in Silicon Valley years ago. That was a weird story. And it's and it wasn't exactly easy to get in touch with prostitutes. Um, but we went on Redbook and started cold calling in my Redbook. It's no longer there anymore. So don't go looking guys. Um, and we started cold calling people and it's just the art of getting on the phone and like trying to call people and tell them what you're up to. So it totally depends on the story, but I also see things online that I think are interesting and I just kind of dig into them. Um, someone told me, uh, that they were investing in a company, uh, that, uh, that would have robots kind of replace human uh, people uh, to clean a big corporate space. And he talked to me about how uh, and where this company was, there was this moment where a, an elderly man who had cleaned like this place for years sat on the floor and started crying because he saw this impact of a robot being able to take over his job. That to me was fascinating. And I was like, I want to get in touch with that guy. So I'd probably go to this guy, get in touch with the company. So all that stuff is kind of, you know, how it all happens. And I also, for startups, because it's so crowded now, um, and it's really difficult for me to to kind of sort through a lot of it. I have like 130,000 emails in my inbox. I go to a lot of times to the investors I know and entrepreneurs I've known for years who always put me in touch um, with interesting startups or interesting companies or interesting people. I, I think it's kind of having that human filter too that helps a little bit. Right. Yeah, and so you'll do a big story on, let's just say Ashley, mm -hmm. let's say Ashley Madison. What, you know, you do all this research, what is kind of your, uh, you know, your thoughts and opinions on on what how that went down and kind of like what were your thoughts after after you well, did all that research first of all, all that? it made like, me men a little bit because 95 percent of the people on ashley madison were men seeking yeah. affairs um but once i put aside my judgment and i checked myself um it was a weird story i mean it was a really really weird uh weird story to report because it people these were victims of a hack and people didn't have sympathy for them. Um, and, and I understand it. It's, you know, it's a lot of people, but, but then you have, uh, you know, then you have this outcome where you have like places in New Orleans where there's like a list uh, of, of people who are cheaters. Now imagine if you were a family and your dad was on that list, you know, you begin to, I don't think anything is ever black and white. And, and I truly think the most interesting stories are in that gray area. For me, it was really powerful to think like, uh, you know, there are probably people and there are probably, you know, families that are getting ruined by this hack. And, and it's not just the people on here that are the victims. You know, there are a lot of other people. And I, and I thought we needed to bring that in our reporting. I was reporting every day on, you know, how people were using accessing Ashley Madison from the Department of Justice. That was awkward when you try to when you figure that out and you call them to confirm. That's always very awkward. Um, but, you know, I was having I, I had this I remember I had this moment when I was covering that story and I was like, we need to push this forward a little bit. We need to figure out a way um, to make this a little more uh, human. Right. Like it's not as simple as these as this hack. And, and I ended up 
going, I was talking to, I've been doing the stories on like religious leaders who were on the list or whatever. And um, one of them told me that a woman had lost her husband because he committed suicide after being on that list. And I remember thinking to myself, I want to interview uh, this woman. I think she's got a powerful story. And, and you're stepping, you have to remember this as a journalist, you step into people's lives sometimes at the hardest, worst moments. Um, and you have to have a lot of respect for that. And you get to step out. They don't. Um, and I ended up getting in touch with her and, uh, having her and her kids come on camera with me and talk about, um, and talk about what it was like and what forgiveness is and how, and the demons he struggled with. And it was this horrific, sad moment, but it's such like a beautiful, a beautiful interview and in that she had kind of this compassion and a time where, you know, many people like would just be so distraught. Um, and I, and I wanted to put it out there and we put it out there and it went everywhere because it was such this nice moment of, of people forced to look at this hack and see these people also as victims. So, um, you know, I think those stories to me are really, really compelling, but I always want to come at it with a, a bit of a new angle with, you know, not just as simple as this happened. Here's the outcome. I think there's always that gray area, a gray area of a story that if you explore it, you can find an incredible sweet spot uh, that's journalistically really important. And how do you navigate the tension between, you know, in that situation exactly, you know, his woman's husband just died, between, you know, her story being powerful for other people, but her maybe, maybe she did want to share the story, but her, you know, some people might not want to share yeah. that story. When, when you're, you know, talking to that woman and asking, or, or you know, finding that out, how do you, how do you navigate that? Tension. What's best for a, her I would say what? there's an art to it, right? Like, um, I cold calling someone who just found out a their husband cheated, b he committed suicide is not an easy call to make. Um, but I think that if you, I, I actually think that if if you handle it with respect and if you understand and and if you are honest and open, I'm always a little bit self deprecating. I think um, I think that's my my way in mm. is I always kind of. Uh, myself a little bit but that's not easy I mean it, it really that's the balance that you always walk as a journalist I had moments um, a friend of mine uh, lost a lot of his friends in the Paris attacks uh, he was supposed to be at a restaurant and his mom called so he wasn't he didn't go and it was his friend's birthday and they um, and all of his friends were killed at, at a cafe and I and I and I didn't to be honest with you I didn't put his name out there as someone we should interview on CNN. I didn't immediately say, oh, we should go get this. He's got a great story. Out of respect to him and his story and his whatever, I just said, like, you know, I'm not even going to go near this because those are things you have to, to listen. You know, you have to have um, boundaries. And, and I remember he was trying to raise money for their family. And at that point, I said, do you want to come on and talk? And, and it, was, it was the right time. I think timing is very, very important. Uh, and also being very respectful is very important. And I think it, those are, it's very hard to balance those, but it's also very important. Right. But, uh, but to that woman, just to give a, a sample, because uh, that, that's a good example, do you say, you know, you're cold calling, hi, I'm Lori, I'm so sorry. Like, how do you even begin? I, I don't. I, wouldn't know how I to think you say, "Hey, I'm a reporter at CNN, and I know this is an awful way to call, and I am so sorry. Um, I've been covering this, and I think you might have a powerful story to share. Um, you know, I think we need to talk about mental health. I think we need to talk about all these things. And if you don't want it, that it's totally fine. I just, I, just, I, just I just want to let you know that I let you know that I'm going to give you a platform, platform to ask you to ask these questions, questions, and your and husband's your story, story could help other people. Um, and and if we have these conversations about mental health, if we have these conversations uh, about you know whatever to infidelity, whatever it is, um, you know, I think it it can it can help other people to look at it. And she was really responsive to it, I think. Um, and I meant, and I meant every word yeah. I said, you know, I'm not just trying to get her on, on camera. I, I think I, I meant every word I said, and that, and that was, uh, really important. I'd be, I think if you're being authentic, that goes a long way. So, yeah. Right. And that's why, that's why you're <laughs> the pro. Uh, so, so you, know, you just mentioned infidelity. So I asked you about the Ashley Madison thing. You then you did this money on you know, the story on, you know, sex, drugs, in Silicon Valley. And, you know, you talk to a lot of people kind of exploring alternative lifestyles. What, you know, after doing all this research, what, what does that make you think? And what are your opinions after? Um, honestly, like my opinion is like, we're, everyone's a weirdo. Like, and, and I just think people are weird and nuanced and like, I, it, it, this might not be for me, but it's like not really my opinion to get to even judge them. I, I guess at the end of the day, um, I, I, I just, 
those are the things I kind of come away with. Um, and I think it's always interesting to expand and to stretch and to have these kind of conversations. I think that kind of stuff is interesting. But it's when I, I look at like entrepreneurs, it's like, even if I have an opinion on a company, I, it's very, it's very much like, uh, it's not really my job to have an opinion on it, right? It's my job to ask them questions and to challenge them and to, um, and to, you know, start a really interesting conversation that, that deserves to be started. I, I don't think for me, like stepping away from it, it's not like I, I like kind of like left myself in like polyamorous mode. I mean, I, I had a lot of people tell me I should go to Burning Man. I don't know. Uh, I have not been to Burning been? Man, but I'm told by a lot of people that I should go, but I don't know. I don't know about Burning Man. I don't know if it's for me, but it seems like an incredible experience. Yeah. 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 I have not been either. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's an interesting question in the chat. Uh, someone asks, um, you know, obviously you handle things, you know, very well, you're, you're a journalist, but is, has there been a time where you kind of overstepped uh, your boundaries? And if so, you know, how did you do to, uh, you know, to rectify um, I don't know. I, I think like I really, I mean, I've certainly never been perfect in my career, but I really think um, I, I do a pretty decent job of walking that line. That's the most important thing to me as a journalist. That's what you have. That's your credibility. Uh, that is, you know, that I, I don't, I don't actually think, I, I think there's times when I've thought like, if I do this, it will be stepping, it, it will be overstepping. Um, but I, I don't actually think like, I've never like sat here and like regretted making the call. I've never regretted picking up the phone and calling somebody. Um, I, I think, you know, even if I've had like a horrific no, which I, I have had, um, I think that's, that's the most important part of our jobs. If you do it respectfully. Um, and if you want, I think I saw some people are asking questions. So I do, should I, should I answer should I be answering these two? Tell me what you think. Oh, perfect, see, I'll, I'll okay, reference good. a few of them. Um, yeah, the end. Um, what um, for kind of aspiring journalists out there? Uh, what's your, you know, you kind of, you know, seven years ago. What, uh, but in 2015's world, what what's your? Oh my God! I think be willing to do anything. I I think that yes, even in this digital world where everything's changed, journalism changed, like. The one thing that hasn't changed is good storytelling and curiosity and giving a shit. And if, um, and I think my, I always tell journalism students who want to get into journalism, um, I was willing to log tape for 12 hours at a time. I would have cleaned the floors at CNN. Like I, um, I, when I didn't end up getting a job down at the breaking news desk, I thought my life was over and, and really it, it wasn't. I took a job somewhere else that I wasn't in, in the company that I wasn't a hundred percent sure of. And I learned and it, it ended up being the best thing that could have happened to me. So I think my advice to journalists is be curious, be persistent, um, and, and care. I, I think we need a lot of people that care in the world. Being a journalist, um, what divides us between, you know, PR people and this or that and, and, what divides PR people and journalists is, you know, you have to seek the truth. You have to give a shit. You have to, um, you know, this is something that I almost say, if you could do anything else, do it. But if there's nothing else you could do, you can't do anything else. I, I, it's, it's like being an entrepreneur, right? Like if, if you can do anything else yeah. besides being an entrepreneur, it's probably best because being an entrepreneur is really, really hard. But if there's nothing else you can do and you are so obsessed with it and you really love it, then you should a hundred percent drive towards it full force. Um, you know, I, I think as a journalist, your first job as a journalist is getting a job as a journalist. Like your first job is getting in the door, is learning uh, to be, to call up someone, to find them, at, you know, to find the editor of a magazine that you want to be at and ask them out for coffee, ask them to get coffee with you, but be persistent and not annoying. Like these are all traits that make a decent journalist. Um, and I think, uh, I, I think that's kind of, that'd be my advice going in. And I think we need more, more than ever, especially now that anyone can post on blogs and online and, and anyone can have an opinion. Now more than ever, um, we need people uh, who care and who want, who really, really want to help in this like increasingly crowded world of, uh, of opinions and, and thoughts and all this stuff. We really, I think we really need people uh, who care. So uh, uh, I don't know. And message me. If you want to be a journalist, message me. I'll probably answer. I like, I like helping people in those ways. Awesome. <laughs> Awesome. So I'm going to ask okay. some uh, rapid fire questions, some of them from, from here. Uh, they don't have to be rapid okay. fire answers, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, you just we talked about how kind of there's some skill sets that overlap between, you know, journalism and uh, being an entre entrepreneur. If you could have any tech job at oh. any tech company. Oh, my God. Um, 
God, probably to be something editorial. Like I love, I think medium is really cool right now. I'm not saying I want a job at medium. I'm happy CNN. I'm happy. Um, but I think medium is really cool. I think because I'm a journalist and I love storytelling, I would not want to do PR. That I will not, I would not do PR, but I think something on in an editorial sense of kind of telling stories, um, Why not PR? PR, it's just, it's like, I just wouldn't, I, I don't know, man. I just like, the, PR is fine. Uh, <laughs> you said a lot without yeah, saying yeah. anything. I, I actually have like a horrific poker <laughs> face too. Um, so you can always kind of tell my opinion. But I, I think a PR is great. It's not for me. Um, I would want something editorial. I, I don't know. I, it's something, and, and it's hard for me because I, I don't really envision myself uh, at a at tech company, but the way tech companies are going, they're becoming a little bit more editorial and you have more journalists kind of going. So I think maybe a role kind of like that. Um, but I, I'm not I'm not actually really sure. Or maybe like I would just sit and have people like talk about their feelings with me at Google because I'm sure they have like, a, I'm sure like along with the massage chair at Google, they also have like someone who just like sits and talks to people. I love talking to people. I love curiosity. Um, so something something along right. those lines. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure they can make up a cool title for that, you, you know? You never want to start your own kind of like BuzzFeed or Vice or um, that you know, media company? Honestly, I see so many people go out and try to do it. Um, and at the end of the day, like I'm a journalist, right? I want to spend so much time and effort telling great stories. And I want those stories to go out to as many people as possible. Um, I'm a slave to a platform. Like I, I want, but at the same time, um, I think that you know, it's okay. I, I, I it's very, te it's very attractive. I think when you see a lot of people going to do this and it's a bit of a wild west of the media. Um, that being said, um, you know, I think CNN's an incredible place. It has an incredible platform. And I think if you can be entrepreneurial about your career from within one of these places, then by all means go and do it. Um, which I think I've always, I, I've always kind of been, but you know, you, you never know. <laughs> You never know, but I don't want to spend time trying to raise money when all I want to do is like talk to weird hackers. I mean, yeah. it's as, as passionate as I am about that, right. I, I want to make sure that those kind of stories get out there. I think it could be really cool in the future when you look at what Netflix is doing and Hulu is doing and how there's such people are starving for content. You'll see these kind of worlds um, come together and maybe some of our stuff would go there. You know, it's, so all of these worlds were in like, I, I always joke that I covered tech and disruption and then tech disrupted us, the media. Um, so it's been interesting to mm -hmm. see that. I think if you could be entrepreneurial and stay in front of it, then I don't need to go start my own thing. Um, yeah, I think that was a long convoluted answer to your also, rapid question. Yeah, yeah. There's also been a trend of VCs going to, sorry, journalism, yeah. journalists going to VCs because it is a similar skill set in some, in some ways. Yeah. And because VCs are, you know, building out their own editorial. Yeah. Um, and it'll be curious to see if, if well, more it is of that interesting. I mean, we we've had people go. Um, you know, it, it is really interesting to see um, some of the tech companies scoop up journalists, um, and and it's a very similar skill. Um, VC and being being a good VC, I think, of being a good journalist because it's like you're always kind of trying to find what's best. You're trying to find the best story or the best startup. Um, you know, you're. I was joking. I think you guys had Andy Weissman on uh, recently. So Andy, I've known for years, and I remember we were That's walking. Right. It was TechCrunch Disrupt years ago, and we we're walking through like Startup Alley, and. And it was like, we realized both of our jobs were similar because people wanted to talk to him, people wanted to talk to me, and both of us were thinking like, all right, well, we need to make sure to sift through and find the best stuff and, and get through a lot of the noise. Um, so I, that's probably why you could see that happening. But for me, like, I like there is nothing cooler for me. Um, like, I remember after we did the revenge porn series, which like I keep bringing up, but it was really important because you had people who... Um, who didn't have a voice, who didn't have a platform, and who had really bad things happening to them. And they didn't have anywhere to go. And it was incredible to be able to tell those stories. And it was incredible to be able to give those people a voice and see change happen. I mean, a month later, uh, Google uh, made some changes to their policy that really had an impact on the on revenge porn. Um, you know, it was incredible to see our, our stuff get pick up. I mean, it is it's so messed up is like part of like revenge porn. If, if this were to happen to you, you would have to copyright your naked images, which would mean sending your naked images to the government, which is so messed up. It just shows that the law hasn't caught up. Right. Um, and we put that out there and I got picked up on like John Oliver who was showing how absurd it was. So to see other people react, to see people um, really begin to, to have a voice and, um, and come into their own through journalism. I mean, that's what I want to do the rest of my life. I mean, I, I don't think I could do anything else for better or for worse. Right. Who, um, what are some of your, I would say, uh, 
top three top favorite, three favorite books. books. Oh my goodness. I have so many favorite books, but I will say right now I'm rereading, um, a lot of like Joan Didion books. Like I love Joan Didion. She just, I love her. Yeah. I just love She's her writing style. I love that. Um, I remember when I first started reading Joan Didion, it was everything I didn't think I was allowed to do as a writer, like use too many conjunctions and make sentences long and short, but period. It was just, it, there was something so magical about her writing and how it was so emotional. And, um, and she told these stories. Like I remember her writing a story about a bride, someone who got a woman who got married in Vegas and like a shotgun wedding. And it was such a beautiful, beautiful short piece. Um, because it said something larger and you just, no matter what, if you couldn't connect with this at all, you just connected with it. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how about, uh, Emily asked, who are some of the people who've most, uh, or who's someone who's most, uh, influenced you um, in your life? Wow. In my life, who's, I, you know, I, I'm always kind of a champion for like women having great female mentors, which like, I think sometimes it, it's, it, we don't really talk about enough, but like, you know, and, and a lot, sometimes, and a lot of times you get into these companies in the corner offices, it's not uh, as many females. You know, I think we all, we have to do better about that. Um, I remember uh, a woman named Susan Grant, who used to head up digital here at, C at CNN. Uh, I loved her. She just like wore all these like weird leather bracelets and like had like short spiky hair and like didn't play by like normal corporate rules. She was just like uh, awesome. And she always kind of put me in my place a little bit. I remember, um, saying I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to be a multi-platform journalist and I wanted to do producing and on-camera stuff, but I, I also wanted to write and there wasn't really that yet. This was like 2010 or 2011 or something. And she said, well, then write up your job description and pitch it. And I was like, what? I can't do that. And she was like, do it. You have to do it. And she was like this massively influential woman here. And it was having her faith in me and having her believe in me and also kind of kick my ass a little bit uh, that, that really helped me in my career. And I've had a couple people like that uh, that I've had kind of like a, a major, a major impact on, on my future. She's certainly one of them. She's not at the company anymore, but she, she was one of those people that, you know, you could call her when things were really dark, but you put you in her place if you were bitching too much, you know? So. Yeah. How, um, and it's interesting, I mean, a lot of what you've referenced, uh, here in terms of your success has been as a result of relationships with great entrepreneurs and, and investors who you've had for years. And, you know, I'm presuming, I'm presuming kind of just when you were starting out, how did you think about that? And or more, so how do you advise other people when just starting out in terms of, you know, developing those relationships that are going to last them for you years? Know, like, I think how the they... one bit of advice I can say is don't be transactional. Um, you know, even for, especially even when entrepreneurs are pitching journalists too, like it's, it's just helps to get to know people. Like I'm interviewing Sam Altman today um, from Y Combinator. And like, I've known Sam because he was my first, first of all, my first on camera interview and like ages ago when he was at Loop. Um, wow. And, and it was never a, what can you do for me? What can I do for you? It was, I think this is interesting. This is interesting. We always get together. We always have coffee. Every time I'm in uh, San Francisco, we always go and get coffee and we talk about work and some life stuff and all this stuff. Like it's never been. And of course, like I, I, I'm sure like he's come to me with interesting startups and I'll, I'll take a look at them because I know him and, and I'm sure, and he will message me back in two seconds. It's very much not a really as much of a transactional thing. I think you develop a, uh, good relationships with people when you care. Um, and, and I think sometimes people can make the mistake of thinking it's a little bit transactional, like, oh, you're here to report on my company or I'm here to do, you know, I, I think, I think developing relationships takes time and, and takes a little bit of effort. Yeah. And at CNN Money for any of these stories, you know, they're somewhat controversial. Has there ever been any pushback to no, we, you know, we, I don't know if we yeah, can air this. I don't know how or, much I can get into that uh, stuff. <laughs> you know, so it's like, okay. look, I, I think, uh, this is what I always say. Um, just like if you're a good startup, like if you know you're doing something right, if you get like a cease and desist, right? Like you're probably like in a good position if someone is threatened by you yeah. or someone is saying, I'm not really sure like you need to be succeeding or whatever it is. Um, same goes, I think, for being a good journalist. If you're not on the phone with legal, we have a, a we have something called the row in Atlanta at CNN, which is like a row of people people who are very smart and have been in the business for a long time who will like dissect your stories and we need them. They're very, very important. Um, but it's not a good story if I, if I'm not, if 
fighting for it or talking about it or talking through it with legal standards. Um, because a good story is oftentimes sensitive and oftentimes, uh, you know, it's taken a lot of time and work and you don't just get to like press publish and put it out there. Um, so, right. uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I've, I'm sure I've had pushback. Um, I, well, I actually don't think I can tell the story. Never mind. Um, this wasn't this wasn't pushback uh, from <laughs> CNN, but this was a company that really didn't want us to put out a story, a big company, uh, and and was very uh, was very adamant about making their opinion known to some of some of the folks here. But you know, at the end of the day, we put it out and made some change, and we 100% stand by it. It was a good story. So, I think your role as a journalist mm -hmm. um, is to champion those kind of things. Right. No, that totally makes sense. What about, uh, what's your take on um, when startups come to you that haven't raised a lot of money uh, or aren't you know, famous yet? What's the best way to pitch you or get your attention or, or just? Hmm. You know, I think it's hard because I, I think maybe people also sometimes who tweet at me, I have my inbox is so full of things that like I miss really important things. Um, I think, you know, I think it's also, it's just like about being a little bit human. Um, and you know, and it's always helpful. Like, let me just give you a little tip. Like if you're pitching a journalist, if you know what they cover, if you've read their stories, if you've watched their videos and you reference it a little bit, that goes a long way because like, there's nothing more shitty and annoying than like someone being like, Lori, I would love to tell you about like my new, like whatever company. And it's nothing I've ever covered. It's nothing I've ever been whatever. And they don't, it's, it's kind of a mutual thing, right? It's like, if you do your homework, I'm a little bit more willing to kind of look and, and sift through the noise. And, and I like people that are human. I like people that are, um, you know, that are a little bit funny and self-deprecating and I don't know, isn't there like that application now who, where you can actually figure out how to pitch someone. It's like called crystal or something. And it like analyzes you. I, you don't see uh, that, but I, th I think that's fascinating because like the best way to get yeah. to my heart and get to my inbox is like being a little funny and self-deprecating and also like doing your research and doing your homework. Yeah. The journalist's heart <laughs> exactly. leads the way to their inbox. Um, when you think of the term uh, success, who, who's the first person that oh, comes? Oh man, to I think success is such a, like a weird term. I, I like, I guess like I, w I interviewed Jack Dorsey uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, and he, to me, uh, in having known him through Twitter and Square, uh, is an interesting success story because I think success to me, um, is, and I think being a good entrepreneur, I, I will say this, like, um, the one thing I can say that's in, that any good entrepreneur I've ever interviewed has had in, in common is this, this idea. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room, but you just have to be the most resilient. Like, it's just like people are going to throw things at you just nonstop and everyone's going to tell you no, 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 no. And it's just like to watch some of these people, no matter what's happened and the highs and the low, like uh, to watch Jack Dorsey, like at the floor, say what you will about Square and, and how it will do in public market, whatever it is, like to watch someone. Uh, take two companies public um, and and also be at a point like and have so much kind of resilience and having the lows and the highs and he also like brought his mom which I think is great you know like I, I just think that for me yeah. is what um, success looks like but success doesn't always have to look like that um, you know I, I don't know I think success sometimes doesn't have to be as grand scale as someone like Jack Dorsey although I know we kind of glamorize it a little bit um, I think success is kind of fighting through the failures and, and, and figuring out exactly who you are and what makes you, uh, and, and having a job you love and giving a shit. I, I think that's, uh, that can be success. Success is waking up for work and caring about what you do. So I, I think it just totally depends, you know, sorry if that got a little dark or mm -hmm. weird. When I, a deep. <laughs> no, no, no. Good. When I ask you deep is good. When I ask you, who is your, uh, you know, what's your favorite, interview you've done of all time what's the first image that, that comes to mind God, I, I, to be honest like i have a, I have a lot and, and you know what's kind of messed up or not messed up what's weird is like it's not necessarily just like the great founder the big founder i've interviewed everyone from like travis from uber to sean park all these people um and and they're all interesting and compelling in their own ways i mean i think my favorite interviews are uh the people who are now the underdogs right my one of my favorite interviews uh was interviewing um a, this woman for our revenge porn series who had been hiding so because every because her naked photos were out there because she had a horrific ex-boyfriend who did awful things and recorded her when she didn't realize it and um my my favorite inter she was one of my favorites because she finally stopped hiding and she told her story and her story helped other people um i think 
those kind of stories are very, very important. I, I thought the woman who had the courage to talk about her husband who had committed suicide during one of the darkest moments in her life uh, was just phenomenal. Um, I, I think those are the stories that for me, I, I, I go home thinking, okay, at least I did something today. Maybe we got like some kind of message out there. Um, but entrepreneur wise, like I've always thought, uh, Sam, I mean, Sam Altman, I think is a really interesting guy who's gone through, you know, highs and lows and is in such an interesting uh, position. Aaron Levy uh, from Box, I think is really interesting because he's always been so human. He's one of the most human founders you will meet. I'll never forget interviewing him and saying, how do you feel about Google launching Google Drive? And whereas most founders would look and be like, uh, give you some kind of like canned response about how we are in a position to navigate the whatever. He was like, he literally asked me, he's like, have you ever been chased by an elephant? I was like, what? And it was this like wonderful moment of him being like, of course we're scared shitless, but this is what we do. This is, this is, you know, and I, I kind of like, th right. those are my, uh, say those are kind of my favorite interviews. And if you could have, and you essentially can, you know, interview anyone you want and have interviewed, but if you could have, let's say, an off the record interview where you can ask anything <laughs> to, to anyone for, for an, an hour, who would you want to interview oh my and God, what that's would you really ask? Hard. That's so hard. I mean, I guess like talking Silicon Valley, like, and Silicon Valley, um, man, that is so hard. I might have to like tweet my answer to that. I, I think. I think it'd be, you know, sure, some of the founders um, that I, I've interviewed throughout the years have gotten, you know, now they have like 10 PR people with them or five PR people. It would be great to get some of those people without their people. Like the, those interviews are so much more fun. Um, so maybe just talking off the record with those people. I'll, I'll maybe tweet an answer to that. I got to think about it. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and this is one of my last questions, I want to respect your time. Uh, what are some of the startups you're most excited about um, recently? You know, I just met with, uh, I actually think there's this interesting trend and I, I don't know how much I'll be, I'll be hundred percent covering it, but you know, it's cool to see startups, um, kind of like take on problems that like the real world has and not necessarily just kind of in Silicon Valley. Um, I think you're seeing a lot of startups like, like service or a lot that help with like the pains of like customer service. Like I met with, uh, one of the folks from air help. I'm not like, I, I don't get like so excited. I think about this, like when I sleep at night, but those seem to be good ones to tackle. I, I also think, um, VR, I don't know when this is going to be, um, when this is going to be mainstream, but I interviewed, uh, Palmer recently, the founder of Oculus. And it was just fascinating to hear. Uh, to hear him talk about uh, some of the implications of virtual reality. And I tried it and it was just unbelievable. It was like this experience of like we, he was, um, it was kind of this uh, experience where both of you guys are, are involved in it. And so he was showing me how to do stuff in this virtual world. And it was so weird and interesting. Um, and, and it just, and it just got you thinking about all this weird stuff. I think uh, the dating apps right now and all this kind of stuff is really interesting because it's interesting to watch it directly impact human behavior and how we treat each other. Um, I think uh, I've interviewed the founder of Tinder and Hinge, and we did that about like a year ago. And it's interesting to see um, how much things have changed since then. So, I mean, there's a lot I I'm excited about. I think the, the stuff that I mean, artificial intelligence right now, I, I think we're, we're just kind of scratching the surface, like the future of ethics and robots, like all this kind of stuff is really cool to, to have like a weird conversation about with a bunch of people, you know? Perfect. Um, so we have time for uh, one uh, audience, mm -hmm. you know, quick person from the audience to come through and uh, why not Howard! the esteemed uh, Howard Lindzen. Uh, <laughs> Howard, you are, uh, you Yay! are on the- Yay! Oh my goodness. Hi, dude. <laughs> Oh what my god, it's so good to see you here on Blab. <laughs> are you, are, I am are still, you in still in New York, York still or? here, fifth floor newsroom. <laughs> and Eric, Eric, where are you, San Fran? Uh, yeah, uh, what is, uh, what's your question for, for Lori Howard? We are so graced to have you. What's changed, uh, I knew Lori was <laughs> So, Lori, what, what, what's changed the most in the last five years? Like, reporting like you've been at CNN in probably four or five years but what, what like uh, for at, C at CNN or kind of in the tech community or for me tech, tech community and then how you approach you know is it like did it take you couldn't get all these interviews at the beginning I remember you were getting your first big yeah. interviews but uh what's changed the most in the tech community in terms of you know speed oh or the company well I think in the tech community what's changed the most in the last like I would say five 
six years or something, like everyone just cares now in a way they didn't before. Like even to see Vanity Fair having like devoting columns to like tech founders and that kind of stuff. Um, it's really interesting, but everything's a lot, uh, to be honest, it's very noisy. I, I find it, I find it harder than I used to. And maybe it's, I'm just not as like deeply ingrained in it, but I find it harder than I used to, to be able to sift through a lot of the noise. I think, you know, everybody, even like when I, you know, when I knew you, like not as many investors cared to, to get in on this, not as many people, um, wanted to work at tech companies. Now that's all completely changed. Um, you know, I, I just think, you know, technology has grown in such like a massive, massive way. And, and here, even at CNN, right? Like if you walk in, I don't know if the last time you were in our newsroom, but if you walk into our newsroom now, we have this huge, um, all these monitors, we call it the war room where everything is monitored using like chart, I think we've used Heartbeat before, like, uh, and we're using technology uh, to see what's trending on Facebook or this or that. We have all these different ways to do it. So, I mean, it's completely, uh, it, from the time, I think, I have, I'm forgetting, I think it was like after TechCrunch Disrupt, it was probably the last time I was in this building and I saw you, um, you know, uh, everything's completely changed. Um, I, I do think it's harder than ever to sift through uh, some of the noise, but it's a really important time where we now need to start asking ourselves really important, larger questions uh, at, at this point. Does that answer? Yeah, 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 it's fun to watch. Uh, the access yeah. increase. You see your, you know, your. Well, I will say, like, I remember access. before, like, it was, it was hard to get a lot of these things on camera, right? It was hard to put on some of these bigger founders and get and put them on CNN, right? Now, like, um, Mark Benioff makes a donation and, and we're covering it on air. You know, that's just so different than it used to be, and, and I think. Um, it's, it's interesting to see these kind of these worlds care about each other uh, a lot more uh, than, than we used to. And the access, you're right. I mean, it is cool that the, the little startups that could are the ones that, um, you know, that have turned into these billion dollar companies that it's, it's interesting when I look back, having kind of known just like how you know, knew me when I was just kind of starting out covering tech. Um, it's cool to look at these founders who I knew when they were like, I remember interviewing Travis from Uber when he showed up in like cowboy boots at South by Southwest and, and had this little app called Uber that none of us is that so many people believe was crazy. Um, it's unbelievable to see how quickly things change and how disruption, uh, if you know, how real disruption can truly change things. So, yeah. The, uh, well, thanks for having me. Blab was cool. I remember meeting the team, uh, Definitely a great use yeah. product, huh? Yeah. Blab. Yeah, the, huge fans of Blab. Using it, I'm using Ooh. it from the mobile. Michael really Michael cool. Birch nice. told me about Blab, and he's like, "You got to check this out." And when I was at Web Summit, we did a, a thing on Blab, mm. and I, and it's it's always really interesting. I I, already, I feel like ancient already. I'm like, there's a new technology coming up, but it it's really cool. I like I, I like the experience on it, and it's awesome to have this kind of conversation where um, you can have a bunch of different conversations and people can call in. That's so cool. So I wonder I wonder what's going to happen. Where maybe we should cover it on CNN. Right. We probably should. Call me okay, Blabby I'm going to, anytime, ready. <laughs> Eric, Eric. I look forward to when you start booking 25. Absolutely. Yeah, at Let some know, point. I'm really, I'm, yeah, I'll get facial hair. The whole Bye, thing. Right, see you guys. <laughs> Thank see you, Howard. Uh, Laurie, I want to be super respectful of, uh, of your time. Thank you for this fantastic interview. Where can people uh, find you? Uh, online and learn more about you know what you um, follow me on Twitter. It's at Lori Siegel CNN, or um, you can add me on Facebook too. I'm I'm pretty good about. I, I actually you can also subscribe too. I put a lot of stuff. I do a lot of personal writing that I'm putting out uh, more publicly. I have a Medium page, but I talk about my feelings a lot on there. I don't know if you're gonna want to get on there. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> feelings. Um, and you can always email me. Uh, my email, it's laurie.siegel at turner.com. So it's not too difficult to find me. And thank you guys all for listening. What a cool awesome. And, uh, and last plugs, we'll yes, look out for your it's, it's upcoming. Gonna be, Hi. so on Monday, you'll see, we're gonna have a whole landing page on CNN Money, and it's gonna, it's called the uh, Secret Lives of Superhero Hackers. And you've gotta look through like, even the art and the illustrations and the fact that we created like a comic book out of it. It's just weird and interesting. Uh, and I hope you guys will, will check it out. And thanks for having me. Thanks for having Perfect. me. Perfect. Yeah, cool. absolutely. See you. I will talk to you soon, Laurie. Thank you for joining Bye. us. Bye. Okay, this has been another episode of Product Hunt Live. Thanks everyone for joining today. If you have feedback, 
feel free to tweet us at Product Hunt Live or at Eric Torenberg if there are other people you want to hear from. Uh, just let us know. Everyone have a fantastic day. Go Blab, and thank you for allowing us to do this. See ya.